Welcome to Dr. Ski's uh, talk today. Um, I just uh, want to have a, a short uh, uh, bio of Dr. Ski's. Uh, we know all uh, Dr. Ski's. Uh, he retired in June 2016, and uh, now he's focusing on his work with global at risk and global um, parametrics. Uh, Dr. Ski uh, has won several outstanding uh, teaching awards. Um, at, at this university uh, for his courses in agriculture and uh, food policy in 2007. He won the University of uh, Kentucky Great Teacher Award for his uh, graduate course in international developments. Uh, in 2005, he, wa he was the recipient of the Thomas uh, Paul Cooper uh, Research Award uh, in College of Agriculture. Uh, now I Thank you. Uh, it's a great, great pr privilege to be back. I moved out on the 1st of October. I uh, asked Jill, who's making the coffee, since Dr. Reed is not here either. And the two of us come, competed to make the coffee between 6 and 6.30, which one got in first. Um, so I'm going to share with you uh, what, what's been going on in my life for the last several years. And I call it my journey. Uh, some of you know parts and pieces of the journey. I'm going to give you a little bit more insight into the whole journey now. Uh, I hope as you listen to the news about what's happening with the United Nations and natural disasters, there's more and more discussion that you're going to hear that ties into what we're talking about today. You can hear it. Um, even yesterday on NPR, they were reporting some of the new information about the ex ante planning and financing that has to go along with natural disasters. Uh, I was speaking at the World Humanitarian Summit, the first of its kind in Istanbul back in May, uh, and this was a major theme, is how do we, with as many natural disasters as we have in the world, and the dire consequences of those problems, how do we finance this? And should we, do it, should we be doing it differently? And obviously, you're going to see that I think we should. We should be talking about ex ante strategies, meaning before the disaster comes, you need to put a plan together. You need to have very clear rules and evidence based standards to react. And then you need to have everything organized in a way where you can finance the disaster. That's the story of global parametrics. That's the story of much of what I've been up to the last years. This journey started in 1989, and I'm going to share this story particularly for graduate students. I was working for the Congressional Commission for the Improvement of the Federal Crop Insurance Program. The worst year of my life. <laughs> uh, the politics were terrible. I was being asked to do things I didn't think were ethical. I was able to escape and go to work uh, with Joe Glover, who was later became um, the chief economist for the Secretary of Agriculture for some years and work with ERS in my last four months of my Washington trip. And that was, that was quite a different experience. But what happened in that time, because we were trying to fix the crop insurance program, is we've done a lot of work to look at the problems with federal crop insurance, moral hazard, adverse selection. You can read a lot of publications about this if you want to get into the detail. But what happened was an old article came to my light about something called area yield insurance. Not using the farm level yield, but rather using something like the county yield for insurance. And this article was published in 1947 in the Journal of Farm Economics. And by the way, it was published by a professor emeritus, still living, Harold Halcrow, who was at the University of Illinois. And I was very happy that Harold Halcrow I, what I did was I took this article to heart and I said, this is the way to do agricultural insurance. It will, it will avoid, you take a third party measurement and you avoid all the problems of moral hazard, adverse selection, and you can do something significant. So I went to work with the federal government and uh, basically out of this department, we created the first outside product 
that was ever done outside of the federal government called the Group, group Risk Plan, based on county yields. So Harold Halcro had written this article, and by the way, he had a very interesting PhD committee. He had D. Gail Johnson, D.W. Schultz, and Milton Friedman. Now, there's two Nobel Prize winners on that committee. And when Hal Pro Professor Halcrow was finished, they said, Harold, this is, this is sensible. Why don't you spend some time in your career and see if you can make this happen? And if you look at Harold Halcrow, you'll see that he was a policy uh, person from Illinois. You can see quite a few books by him on agricultural policy. So he was testifying before Congress about the group risk plan. So, so he's the one that told the story when we brought him here to launch the group risk plan. I was really happy that he was still alive and, and he was healthy and he, he was very pleased to see that we did this. <clears throat> that one journal article recognized graduate students. 1947 was when the article was written. 1992 was when we actually put it into practice in the United States, okay? So don't get discouraged. Somebody <laughs> might actually look at your stuff someday and say, well, this is, this is interesting, and it's worth trying, okay? That changed my whole life. <clears throat> and there's a lot of kind of mystic stories that go with this. But one day I was sitting in the hotel where Forrest Gump saw the guys in the water. Oh, it was somebody else. The guys in the water gate, remember the movie with the flashlights? Whenever they discovered that there was a break-in in the Watergate Hotel, some of you may not know about this, was a very bad time in American history. We have some bad times now, but politics were not so good then either with Richard Nixon. And I was sitting in the hotel, and I get this phone call from somebody that I'd seen about two years earlier with a professor called Peter Hazel. And I had dinner with Mike Gudger and Peter Hazel telling them about the group risk plan. They said, this is the only way you can do insurance internationally. This is, this is interesting. We need to do something like this. So Mike Gudger calls me in this hotel. And I have the coffee cup to show you it was the 25th anniversary of the break into the Watergate Hotel. <clears throat> he says, I'm in Argentina. I'd like to know how you did this. Now, you can look how we did it in the 1997 American Journal article on area yield insurance and rate making. So I explained to him, a few hours later, I'm back in Lexington, and the phone call comes from Peter Hazel, who says, let's go to Nicaragua and do this. Now recognize, it had been about two years since I had dinner with these guys, and back to back, within 12 hours, I get these two phone calls. Okay, I have to do this. So I went to Nicaragua. We tried to do something um, looking at drought and trying to develop an index insurance based on drought conditions. And we, we didn't make much progress, but I, I won't ever forget one particular banker there. And that, that's had a lasting impression, you'll see some of this through this presentation, who said, really, you know what? I'm not interested in drought. This guy had a PhD from Princeton, by the way, and he was doing the math. He said, why don't you give me drought and excess rain? And since they're not correlated, you can give me a better price. <laughs> he wanted to hedge off excess rain because he was worried about hurricanes in Nicaragua. Now, I want you to remember something. There was a major hurricane called Mitch that went right through Central America only three months later. Only three months later. Now, I had struggled and tried to get the World Bank, I was working with the World Bank then, try to get them focused on doing something on hurricanes in Central America, but we were too late and it didn't happen. But that left a strong impression on me, that there were a lot of different natural disasters that were going to have an impact on this particular business. He was making loans to microfinance loans to lots of different businesses, small businesses around Nicaragua. So there's Nicaragua. What I try to do is bring some of those World Bank contracts into the university. The World Bank wouldn't see it. They couldn't see the, they, they'd done some things like this with various universities before. It was never successful. So I knew that I was gonna be doing more and more consulting, consulting with the World Bank, so I set up Global Ag Risk. I reduced my appointment in the university 
and the journey started now because things were starting to pick up. We did a lot of projects. Um, we did the Mongolia Livestock Insurance. That's an area yield insurance just the same way as Harold Halper wrote about, where we actually were insuring herders against extreme mortality in their region because in Mongolia they have massive cold weather events that kill millions of animals at the same time. And I spent 14 years flying back and forth to Mongolia. Sam Benon. I know if you were in Mongolia. Uh, it was a great experience. And we did something that just recently um, the World Bank has said this, is a, this project was in the top 1% of all projects in the last decade. And it, it, it has a legacy to it. There's actually a, an agricultural reinsurance company in Mongolia. We did a lot of things to look at pooling risk across Mongolia, how to, how to bring it to the, the global markets and transfer the big catastrophic risk out. So the journey was going and things were coming together for me. And some people that took my development course know some of these stories already. Uh, there are not many faces left though. <coughs> You're going to get out soon, right? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so this, this was another piece of evidence where I, and Kenny's here too, but he, this was another piece of evidence where things were starting to come together. Um, then I was asked to do a review for the German bank called KFW. It's, it's one of the larger investment banks in, in making investments in developing countries. It comes out of the Marshall Plan, in fact where at that time the United States and the British knew how to think about reconstructing a country after you destroyed it with bombing. <laughs> and we actually put a bank together, and that bank is now one of the major banks in the world that contributes to economic development around the world. So that's quite a legacy. KFW asked me to do a review of some ideas that are similar to what I'm going to present to you. And a few years later they said, well, we like what you're doing around the world. We did Peru, we did a forecast insurance, an insurance product that paid even before the disaster occurred based on El Nino, the first of its kind, I think, in the world. We don't see anybody else doing that yet. Uh, that was quite a discussion with the regulator, the insurance regulator. We did work in, on earthquakes, an agricultural economist working on earthquakes. Why would somebody do that? Because it was the same type of thinking. With, with catastrophic risk. We worked in Vietnam, drought, in um, the coffee production region in the Central Highlands, a, a flood index on the Mekong Delta. So as we were doing these projects and we were writing and developing publications and we had support from the, the Ford Foundation, uh, Gates Foundation, we're just finishing up a Rockefeller Foundation support. So as we did this, <coughs> the Germans came back to me in 2010, and they said, would you build a business strategy to, to scale up these ideas? And I said, OK, sure, we, we do this type of work with global leg risk. No, 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 you don't understand. We're only going to give you some money to support some travel. You're supposed to be an entrepreneur now. Well, I kind of like being a professor. Why would you ask me to do this? Okay, I'll do it. <clears throat> well, I built the business strategy. They weren't quite ready for it. Uh, then I, I took the business strategy to DFID, the Department for International Development of the British government, and a, a friend of mine who we'd written together in a book that's called Insurance Against Poverty, Professor uh, Stefan Derkin, who's at Oxford University, had just freshly become the chief economist for this development agency. And so he picked up great enthusiasm. And I can tell you that on August the 15, 2012, he said, this is great. And he brought all the top management from DFID into this meeting. He said, you have three minutes, kind of like a Donald Trump Prentice show or something. You have three minutes, and if you don't do this right, this is over. You need, to, you need to pitch this to these managers in this agency. When it was finished, there was a lot of enthusiasm for the ideas. And he said, we can get this funded in six months. The 
British are still not there. <laughs> when I come home, I tell my wife, the British are not coming. <laughs> I'm hoping someday I can ride the horse and say the British are coming, but not yet. The British aren't there, and it's not easy. There's a lot of challenges down here. Meanwhile, the Germans came back involved in the story, and they recognized that what we were doing was quite interesting and useful. In 2015, we had a quality assurance review just to punctuate that this wasn't particularly easy. Uh, let's see, February 22nd, 2015, 6.34 in the evening, I stepped on the ice on my driveway and broke an ankle. And it was a pretty serious break. And about 11 hours later, the economist from DFID gave us a quality assurance review on our business strategy, and we flunked. We absolutely flunked. So that wasn't exactly a good day. <laughs> uh, what, we, what I learned was that the economists were reviewing a business strategy almost like they would review a journal article. Can you imagine economists doing that, where they were kind of nitpicky about things that really didn't make much difference in terms of the business strategy itself. So we picked up our boots, casting the whole thing, crutches, and we started over, and we got some different people inside the agency, and then later, the Germans came in, and we actually signed a shareholder agreement. Whew, this was a long process, April the 14th. And we had, you can't believe how many documents are involved when you get into a business of this nature in terms of signing a shareholder agreement. And we started at 8 o'clock in the morning, and it was 8 o'clock at night before we actually signed it. <coughs> the British signed it. And the British still have a lot of say in this company, but they only have one pound invested right now. The Germans invested through something called the Climate Insurance Fund. So that's some background. We've got our first investment. We're up and running. I have an office on the Edward <coughs> Road. What's Global Parametrics? This is meant to be a company that will change the way people actually think about managing natural disaster risk. And it's not my idea all by itself. This is a long history of 20 years of what the World Bank has been doing and a lot of other development agencies to try to think about how do you structure ex ante financing so that different stakeholders in the world can prepare for natural disasters. There's something called the African Risk Capacity. <coughs> and it's similar to what Global Parametrics is. The African Risk Capacity is about drought for African nations. I was writing about this in 2002, and Global, Global Ag Risk had a contract to look at Ethiopia and try to map, model out drought and think about hedging drought. And actually there was a derivative contract written with the World Food Program, and this is kind of the history of what happened to bring in the African risk capacity. So I've been watching a lot of different developments in the world. Let me, let me crank back a couple of steps for you. In 2000, I started looking at what was happening with trading weather in the United States, because it's, it's tied in, right? Extreme weather conditions, if you actually try to hedge off weather like a futures contract. But there were, there, there were some contracts developed on the exchange for weather, main, mainly to hedge off energy cost for extreme cold days or extreme hot days, um, so, and try to think about how energy companies would be in a bad situation during the winter if it was too warm, because they would have a business interruption, they wouldn't be making the, the same revenue. Or in the summer, if it was not, too, not hot enough, they weren't generating the same electricity. So there was really interesting developments happening. Anybody heard of Enron? 
So, in, the, in, the, in January of 2001, I took two Argentine guys into Enron to talk about trading weather because they were, Enron was looking at agricultural hedging as well. And by the way, Coke industry, I went to Wichita to talk to them because Coke was also trading in 97. They were looking at trading off weather as a way of managing big, <coughs> big disaster risk for agriculture and other purposes. And then in, in the March, I came back to Enron with a, with a guy who's now the chief, chief executive officer of Global Parametrics, Hector Ibarra, from Mexico, because he was with the Agricultural Insurance Company of Mexico. And he came here a year earlier, and I sat with him with SAS, helped him think about portfolio management. So he's our chief executive officer today. We went to Enron because the Mexican government with their agricultural insurance program was, was trying to think of hedging off some of these risks as a way to manage the risk more effectively. And then the guys at Enron said, well, why don't you come back down and we'll talk to you about some consulting. So in May of 2001, I went back down to talk about some consulting opportunities, and I asked a stupid question. You know, you do a lot of due diligence whenever you think about these opportunities. You should. You want, to, you want to make sure you're working with somebody that's reliable and reputable, etc. And I was very, very seduced by the whole setting of Enron. But I asked one question at lunch. How come I'm the oldest guy here? And some guy that was 32 says, oh, by the time we're 40, we're all billionaires. <laughs> well, something's wrong here. <laughs> Now, Enron went up in smoke about four months later, okay? But in the meantime, I went over to work with Kansas City group called Aquila. And Hector, the Mexicans, actually did a deal with Aquila. And then I started to learn and watch as Enron went up in smoke. All these people that were trading weather moved over to the reinsurance market. Almost all the people that I was making contacts with in that time period moved over to the reinsurance market. Some other things were happening, too. <coughs> Richard Sander, who I was working with in the mid-90s, he was involved in trying to think, can we actually create an exchange against hurricanes off the eastern seaboard? So one day, Richard Sander walks me on the Chicago Board of Trade. There's a little chalkboard, bid ask on hurricanes off the eastern seaboard. And I said, Richard, Who's on this, both sides of this market? I can't record this, but he said, I'm on both sides. <laughs> so he was trying to make a market work. After that, what happened was that a whole new <clears throat> revolution in how to manage natural disasters started with something called catastrophe bonds, where equity investors in your TIAA CREF, I can promise you that you have some exposure to hurricanes off the eastern seaboard. It's not correlated with what happens in the equity markets. So it's interesting to think about putting a structure together for an extreme disaster like an earthquake or a hurricane off the eastern seaboard. And 70% of the exposure in, in catastrophe bonds is actually hurricanes off the eastern seaboard. And Matthew does, did make some payments in the cap bonds. So this was interesting. Back to the core message. <coughs> what we are going to be offering is a comprehensive package of solutions where we're going to work with stakeholders, not governments, mainly private sector humanitarian organizations, to some extent with cities, because the World Bank has left cities behind thus far. But we will be working with them to consider how to optimize and manage natural disaster risk. And we will blend together <coughs> solutions that hopefully will be effective and efficient in terms of use of capital. Now, what does this mean? This is a classic way of finance and managing risk is you have to, and every one of you should be doing this in your own personal life as well, you use savings for things that happen frequently, 
you use access to the bank and credit for the more moderate risk, and for the catastrophic things, you need insurance. So you layer out the risk and you make things affordable. Now my frustration in working with U.S. crop insurance is that we move from here over to here pretty quickly. Look at what's happening with the Farm Bill debate today and you'll see that the GRP has, is, got, is written all over. We're talking about area revenue insurance. All of that has a history with what happened in this department with the group personnel. <coughs> So what are we doing here? We're putting together the best science that we can have access to, financial engineering, and we will have access to a fund of risk capital <coughs> so that we can innovate and underwrite these natural disaster risks. Now that's the hard part. All of it's hard, but this, this part right here is where we're really struggling right now with the British because they want it to be in England, and it, it just doesn't work in England. The, the regulatory environment's not set for what we're trying to do. Nobody in, no, there is no British law that will, uh, insurance law that will allow us to write a contract that pays before the disaster. And we plan to do that, that type of thing. So global ag risk, we have a company that's a subsidiary of Global Parametrics, which is a holding company in London. London it's just England. London, England. Not, London. not down the road at, at the lake. No. Nope. London, England. And Global Parametrics R&D, I will still be a professor at some level because I'm going to have a really bright team of, of young people with science backgrounds, financial backgrounds, and also computer things that I've never dreamed about in terms of Python and all these different languages to build, build a, a platform. So we're, we're going to be doing something really interesting right here in Lexington. That was a major coup. British didn't want to support that, but we've got it. What are we talking about? We're talking about exposures in the lower part of the planet. The, low, the, the southern hemisphere is mostly emerging markets, and you can see that exposures there are greater. Poverty is greater. With poverty and exposures to natural disasters, you have significantly more problems. Uh, the access to insurance, direct insurance solution, is not present in that part <coughs> of, of the world. So we have a real gap. <clears throat> There's all kinds of things that go wrong when you have natural disasters that affect these countries. And it, it happens at almost every level when you think about a value chain of capital. When I taught the development course, the way I started this semester is I started out by saying, okay, where's the Cobb Douglas production function? Capital and labor, allocation of capital and labor. Where's most of the capital in the world? And where's the most of the labor? Most of the capital's in the northern hemisphere. Most of the labor's in the southern hemisphere. So what's wrong here? Why is it that the capital isn't just flooding? If the Cobb Douglas production function works right, the capital should be flooding into the southern hemisphere. Well, I'm gonna explain that the rest of the semester. I, I try to decompose all the parts to help the people understand why it wasn't happening. Economics is a fantastic discipline, but there's one part of the equation that you better put in, into your calculus, and that's the T part, transaction cost. My word, is, is that huge when you start talking about making these kind of things work. It's a tremendous burden, the transaction cost, and the legal and regulatory environments and all the constraints that are creating those problems for that capital flow. The other part, that if I was teaching development economics again, I would teach it completely different because the development financial institutions, what they tend to do <coughs> is they have money and they put funds together and they have competition for fund management, funds for microfinance, funds for infrastructure. We're going after a fund for natural disasters. And that's the way that development takes place. And, and there's 
45 billion dollars of capital flow a year going into emerging markets from the IFC of the World Bank, KFW of Germany, the Dutch banks, 45 billion dollars a year. Very little of that even thinks about the natural disasters exposure. Yet, the financial officers in those agencies are doing the due diligence to actually lead that flow of capital. And once they give it a sign of approval, then the commercial banks come in behind them. And that's the way the flow of capital works, okay? But they're not looking at natural disasters when they make those assessments. And one thing that we learned as we interviewed some of these investment officers, which was very discouraging, is if they recognized that a disaster was there, they might actually cut back on the amount of money they would give for the investment. That's the wrong answer, I'm sorry. That makes the investment more exposed, right? So that's a big part of our story, is if we can be invested in by the same agencies that are leading this capital, and then we can go back into them with a much more sophisticated way of thinking about science and financial disaster risk management, maybe we can change that dynamics. Think about your benefit cost courses if you start putting natural disaster risk into the equation. It changes a lot of dynamics. <coughs> I've left this up long enough that you've got some of the ideas. I'm going to move along here because there's this is, this is what motivated the whole story about why is it that we're trying to do a public-private partnership, which I've written a lot of papers against, by the way, <laughs> public-private partnerships. And I've taught political economy for a long time. And one thing I remember is when I started the lecture on government failure, the first thing I always said was, governments don't keep contracts. And now I'm living it. So it's good to know <laughs> that this was a problem when you start to try to develop a public-private partnership because there's too many changes. We don't even have the same people working with us as we started with. We, we were on about the six different project officers in the British government right now. So, so this is tough, and it, it does create this institutional memory of actually doing a public-private partnership is really challenging. <coughs> So where are the problems? Because what I was trying to do as I moved around the world was, okay, how, how can we make these markets work? And what's missing? Well, there's, there's a ton of things missing. This is a free rider problem. It's a data problem. It's the small, smallest transaction is what we learned because we were building these programs like Mongolia for individual herders there, for farmers in other parts of the world. And you just couldn't grow the thing large enough, fast enough to really be interesting for a private market, so it required extra support of some sort. Those data challenges are everywhere. We're talking about something that has a highly correlated risk, and it, right out of the gate, by the way, if you pick up any classic book on insurance, the precondition for insurance is independent risk. This is a correlated risk. Why does that matter? It matters because you can happily go along collecting premium, and if you have a major earthquake or a major hurricane, and all the people in the community have a loss at the same time, the insurance company is bankrupt, right? They can't, you can't price it high enough <coughs> to protect yourself. So what happens is that risk gets spread around the world through very creative structures into the reinsurance markets, now into the catastrophe bond markets that I talked about. The thin market problem. This is an oligopolistic industry. There's a lot of competition in some ways right now, but this still, when you start to innovate and you recognize what happens with these major <coughs> reinsurers that are going into the development banks, you can see some challenges. The regulatory side, it's not the same. In Peru, we worked with a very sophisticated regulator and they accepted our arguments that writing a business interruption type of insurance was sensible for the extreme El Nino. And they did it on the basis of the evidence that we provided that, shows that showed that the financial institutions were actually making a lot of adjustments that were very expensive for them way before 
the flooding started in the northern part of Peru because they knew it was coming once the sea surface temperature warmed up to certain levels. So that was a great experience. We had, I learned so much from that experience. And a lot of those guys were out of the Ohio State, by the way. <laughs> we won't only get them. So there's the CAD bond market. Now think, think about the Enron story, exchange markets, getting more pension fund investors involved in spreading natural disaster risk. So what you're moving toward is a, an ability to commoditize natural disaster risk. If you could reduce the transaction cost, right? Lots of transaction costs because these have to be tailored products for that geography, that exposure. This was part of the thought process of putting a fund together. So far, we have approval that we can put together these contracts in the emerging markets and we can counterbalance them with the catastrophe bonds. That work was based on my work in Peru because if you notice, there were no hurricanes in the eastern seaboard of the United States last year. Does anybody know why? Anybody? Because we were in an extreme El Nino year. And now we move back to a La Nina year and we're having hurricanes, okay? It's negative 50% correlated with El Nino. And by the way, with extreme El Nino, in the countries we care about, they have exposures, they have droughts, they have flooding, they have a lot of extreme climate events in the extreme El Nino. So we, we made the argument, successfully so far, that we can hedge our risk by getting into the catastrophe bond market and try to efficiently manage risk in a different way. Okay, so what are we about? This is the natural disaster fund at the top. The document I sent out from the G7, if you look at the very first thing they talk about, the NDF, the natural disaster fund, that's us right there. Global parametrics. There's a TA facility. All this is global parametrics in the blue. We're trying to grow a market in a very unique way with innovation for big, major reinsurers in the world. And if you go back to Nobel Prize winning economics groups, professors like Sired and March, about bureaucratic rigidities, you'll appreciate that if you get large enough as a business, like a lot of global reinsurers who have very rigid rules about everything, it's a little bit hard to innovate. You can't innovate if you get so big that your bureaucracy and all the rules within your structure are, are preventing you from trying new things. So this is part of our argument. We, we will have limited amount of capital and we'll bring those markets along is part of the dream here. The clients, we'll talk about some of those in a bit more. So here's, here's where we're going. Risk data, optimization, risk transfer, layering risk. That's the story. Financial disaster risk management. Drought, floods, cyclones, earthquakes, extreme temperature. Those are five that are on our list. There's a lot of variations of these in different parts of the planet. This is, this is, I could talk about this for too long. We ran into a guy some years ago who's in Savannah, Georgia. He trained to be a cosmonaut. He's a very peculiar guy, <laughs> really interesting. And he's built a risk hazard platform. He advises the Florida hurricane authorities. And if you were watching the press during the Matthew, you would see Charles Watson quoted quite a lot. He was working with something called the Caribbean Risk Insurance Facility that the World Bank supported and doing the modeling for them. He's got these models that help these risk models. He made an estimate that the losses in Haiti would be 10% of the GDP within 24 hours of the event, watch that number. He's going to be very close. Here's the, this was an emotional moment for me because I was having dinner with a statistician in Savannah, and he said, within six hours after the Boxing Day tsunami 
and hit Indonesia, Southeast Asia. Within six hours, he was on the phone with Chuck Watson. And Chuck Watson said, there will be over 200,000 people that have perished from this tsunami. It was 230,000. And it took months before we knew it was 230,000. How did he do that? He had all that science to know the energy and what was happening with those <coughs> displacement, uh, the cliffs that were basically under the water. He put the waves up. He had a, he had a grid of all the population, and he made that estimate. That's pretty good. We think we have something here. He's been doing this work for us now with numerical models where we actually will have a global coverage. We have global coverage now on the administrative level for daily rainfall back to 1979, daily temperatures, min and max, wind speed. He has the tropical cyclone data back as far as the history goes. In, in the Atlantic Ocean, that's over 140 years. In the rest of the world, it goes back to about 1949. So you can start to think about risk and hazard with this type of analysis and this type of data set. And that's going to be the key to us. We have two projects now that we're finishing with Global Ag Risk. Um, one is the Rockefeller Grant, and the other one is something called the Humanitarian Innovation Fund, where we're working to model drought for food security purposes with a group <coughs> called the START Network. And the START Network has 39 international NGOs with linkages right down into NGOs in, in lots of developing countries. So we're going to do some modeling on drought with them. These are some of the variables we have. The drought work we're looking at is using all that climatology with proven equations to, to make an estimate on a daily basis of the soil moisture conditions at different depths for the whole world. It's going to be wrong lots of places. It's going to be okay in some places. It'll be really spot on in others. But it's a process. And we, we're going to take it a little differently than a lot of the risk modelers who focus first on a geography and try to get it all right there. We're, going to, we're developing a consistent methodology that we can apply and modify and improve along the way. This is interesting because this is the different administrative units with satellite imagery on the vegetative greenness up against the soil moisture. And you can see that they match up reasonably well. And you can see parts of East Africa with the bimodal cropping season that you have in Kenya. So you, you know this, these, these, these match up with the cropping season very, very well, as you would expect. So we have this ability to do this around the world. We also have the data now to look at the different cropping systems, the timing of the cropping systems. So we've created a system to come up with a country index on soil moisture. And then statistically, we take the 37 years of data. We do a lot of different curve fitting that involve parametric and non-parametric distributions. And we come up with estimates of the severity of the event. And as we tell the humanitarian community all the time, you need better science. You don't have the same response for a year, an event that happens every five years as one that has, happens every 50 years. You need to understand that if you're going to make good decisions about how to implement programs. This is the Kenyan drought of 1984. That was a very severe event in East Africa. Uh, this methodology is calling it. In Cambodia, we've got some things going through <coughs> it. We, we're, we're actually seeing this, this works. <coughs> works some places, some places, maybe not yet. All right, so this is the story. UKA, KFW, the German government through something called BMZ, the department that's leading a lot of the G7 on climate change. Uh, they have this <coughs> unfortunate name called the Climate Insurance Fund that's funding us. Uh, I hope you appreciate you can't really write insurance on the climate. You can write insurance on the weather and extreme weather events that happen from one year to the next. But climate is long-term phenomenon. So it's a little bit misnamed, but this is you can understand some of the politics of that. What's, what's been so marvelous, 
is we have some of the best law firms in the world that are working for us for free. You guys may not, I didn't know these guys. Aiken Gump, out of New York, London, they're spending a lot of time with us, <clears throat> trying to help us get it right. Tax considerations, transfer pricing on taxes and all kinds of things that I never even dreamed about, that I would ever work on. There's a group out of, out of Guernsey called uh, Appleby, because we think the structure should be in Guernsey, which is a little island between France and the UK, that does the, the types of regulatory structure that we're interested in. We, we, choose, we chose not to go to Bermuda, but Guernsey, which is the third largest jurisdiction for these type of regulations in the world. We even got PricewaterhouseCoopers to give us pro bono services. And we were told they won't do it, but they did. So what are we looking at? Financial institutions, microfinance, recovery lending. We're working with Vision Fund right now on a recovery lending program. This is the first microfinance group in the world that I've run into that are happy to go into the storm after the disaster and make more loans. That's interesting. You can imagine how interesting that is because this is when the community needs it the most, right? So you have this big demand for capital. And most people are not lending. What happens when there's a big demand and there's no supply? Price of capital goes up. And the volatility of capital. That's, a, that's our theory of change. That happened with Katrina, that they stopped lending to small medium enterprise. It happened with Sandy. It happens all over the world. It's not just in the developing countries. So if we can figure out how to sort this a bit in that way, we, we might make some progress. Renewable energy, disaster relief we've talked about, infrastructure for cities, mainly focused on things like systems for hospitals and water that gets, get, that gets so disrupted when there's a, a major typhoon or earthquake. And then, of course, I'm not going to leave agriculture behind. Value chain in agriculture, not smallholder farmers. That doesn't work. Here's a little bit more detail than you maybe want, but this is, in practice, what we're doing with Vision Fund. And it, it's really interesting because what we're talking about is having one contract for 11 countries for different risk for Vision Fund. There's four in Asia, five in Africa, three in Latin America, or two in Latin America, whatever sums to 11. And Basically, the idea is that you write a contract that's like a derivative for a drought in Tanzania, Honduras, a hurricane, and you basically move those contracts across the planet, and you're pooling those risks. So what are you doing? You're going back to the principle of insurance. You're trying to make these catastrophic, highly correlated risks more diversifiable, more independent by pooling on. And we plan to give the benefit of the pooling to the global entity that we're working with. Reinsurers don't do that. But we also know we're going to make mistakes. So the pot in the middle is the savings account. Over to the other side, <coughs> we can put access to liquidity and borrowing the vision fund might do in order to shore up the financial institution. So think about an event happens down here, Philippine hurricane, and this it was after the typhoon of 2004 high end that they went straight in and started making loans to people who just had no houses left. They went in and loaned, and they had 99% repayment. People get serious when they've had an event like this. They build back better, and they're going to pay you off. That's what they're demonstrating. So you have an event down here. We make a payment in here. If we haven't given enough money, they have money in the middle. If they need to borrow money from another financial institution for liquidity, they can borrow money. So they're managing what's called basis risk with these type of products in a very effective way. This is a program where we think we'll have our first buyer uh, next year. We hope so. 
They've just <coughs> they've been in the Philippines in the last week, weeks, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and Cambodia. And Cambodia is very, very much on board already. There's the idea, and you're making a master contract. What are you doing in this process? It's been great to watch because we've actually created the dynamic where they're thinking about how they're leveraging these different financial institutions and they're actually improving, I think, I can see it happening. They're improving the allocation of capital across these financial <coughs> institutions now. Vision Fund is supported by World Vision, which is a big humanitarian organization. So there's a little bit of history about the sponsor <coughs> and some of the things we've done. This is a slide that we present when we're out there trying to get money. And we're out there trying to get some more money with another investor today. Uh, so that's it. Happy to take some questions. No questions? Yes. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first, how do you, in countries like Africa, where a lot of countries are actually sharing the same risk, and might be subject to the same catastrophic event at the same time, how do you, I mean, what does your portfolio look like in those, in those parts? And uh, that's my first mm -hmm. question, I'll ask the second one. Uh, how much have you made so far? And, <laughs> <laughs> and where, and how, I mean, how does it look like, your, your business so far? So we don't have the risk capital yet, yeah. so we haven't written any contracts first. We have a lot of documents. And we have an investment policy guidelines for how we're going to manage the fund. The fund, the risk capital that we're seeking, is meant to be renewable capital. We're not supposed to just lose it. <laughs> we're, we are incentivized to make sure that we price it right, we underwrite the risk in a proper way, and make sure that the capital base stays there into perpetuity. That's what's key. This is not a project. This is a sustainable company for social purpose. So to answer part of the way the thinking is going, if we're in Africa and we have a, a major risk and we have a major opportunity to underwrite something, let's say in Ethiopia, where they've built a lot of hydro right now, and they're all exposed to the same kind of drought conditions, and that could be multi, multi, multi millions of dollars, if we were able to model that out and actually get a contract like that, we would have a limit on how much we would retain. The rest of it we would push off into the global markets. That's why the global markets like us right now. They don't see us as a threat at this point. We hope they never do because we, we won't, there's too much risk. And if we had those opportunities and we have done it properly, we'll be able to place that in the rest of the market. So that's part the answer to your question. Other questions? Yes. So, the, can you talk a little more about the soil moisture um, mm -hmm. index? Like, where, what, what scale is that? At the administrative unit, uh, the first, like the province or the state of the country. Okay. We're looking at Malawi right now that has 25 administrative units. Ethiopia has these massive administrative You're units. You're saying it's measured by or it's measured at? <laughs> We're making an estimate <coughs> for the soil moisture in that geography with all the climatology and the lag of the previous soil moistures using the, the classic literature on how you estimate soil moisture with rainfall and temperatures and evaporation estimates and all this, right? So we, we don't have probes. There's no probes there. It's being calibrated off the equations from, like, the Nebraska but Drought Center. Is there not a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of variability within each administrative unit. So there is indeed. Isn't that? Yeah. And we, we think we can see it in our early work. We, we, what we're trying to do is lay a foundation so that we can keep improving how we're doing this. So this is very early work at this stage. I mean, is that one of the areas you see, like, for a lot of potential improvements? And yes, and absolutely. Uh, this, this is, I, I think I can confidently say that what we're doing with soil moisture and trying to make these estimates is better than anything I've seen at this stage. I mean, I'm just thinking like comparison 
you know, measuring poverty, I, you know, that's really hard to do. Yeah. And so there's, there's kind of approaches that are coming. At, um, there's a science article that came out recently that looked at the connecting survey data to, um, to satellite imagery to, to get better estimates. And I'm just wondering how critical is that component to your... It's a great question. So with the STAR network, we're building a prototype software that gives them that profile of the soil moisture historically and gives a view of the risk for each of those administrative units. And we're letting the humanitarian organization pick and choose the administrative units that they care about mm -hmm. with the secondary data like where's the most poverty, where's the transportation across borders, mm -hmm. in order to think about the fact that some products can move into the area if there's a deficit. So we're, we're actually trying to put systems together with GIS mm -hmm. and these secondary databases to give that community a first prototype tool so that they can make some of those allocation decisions. Because they'll basically be organizing, not for one country, but a block of countries where drought matters, right? It doesn't affect just Kenya when the drought goes in East, East Africa. So they'll be putting the blocks together with the, with the NGOs that work in those countries that have the wherewithal to get in there fast. We're going to do forecast of droughts so that the payments can come in there much faster than what happens with the United Nations systems. And if we can do this right, we hope that it keeps children off of IVs and all the other things, which is very expensive. So the benefit <coughs> cost of it is part of the calculus that we're going through in a very crude way, I might say. <laughs> we need more research on all these topics. <coughs> How do you deal with the fact that sometimes forecasts are wrong and these products are triggered by forecasts? You've been working on forecasts in your ensemble. Well, I think... There are huge sums of money that, that go out, you know... So here's, right here's what's interesting. Uh, one of my friends was watching what we did in Peru. And he went to work with the German Red Cross. And so the, the Red Cross is now looking at forecast-based financing in order to, to get funds in before disasters happen. And they've taken a view. It's, it's really interesting, and I should send you some of the linkages if you haven't seen it, because they, they're, they're trying to get into that exact question. But they're taking a view that if we're right more often than we're wrong, this is worth doing, right? And that's kind of a brave view to take. But I, I can also tell you, <clears throat> having participated in this activity in Peru with the Red Cross and then in Geneva when they had a big workshop, there's a problem. Because this is really very exciting for the humanitarian community to think, oh, we can make these forecasts and we can get money quickly, and it's really sexy and we can, we can actually make a big case to get money quickly. What they're missing is any allocation of price and resources. As you might imagine, this is exciting for them, but they haven't put the calculus in to say, wait a minute, on a five-year event, how much money should I get versus a 50-year? And who should be deploying that money? And that's what, that's what we're going to try to work on. So, so there's a lot of components to your question, but I, I guess the answer is you have to believe you're going to be more often correct. Let's just hope you're correct earlier on. And, and maybe wrong once your yeah. product's been established. And then you can look at the value of forecast uh, literature and you can see how people have done this with stochastic dominance and other tools. Yeah. Other questions? What, yeah. what happens when man-made events start masking themselves as natural disasters yeah. and start changing your probabilities? Well, and, then, and one example right now is like Oklahoma with the fracking. They had like five earthquakes a year, maybe. And now they're at 3,000. Well, what about climate change? And, and that as well. If you believe it's, it's real and you believe it, it does create more extreme events, taking a view on 50 or 60 years of climate data that we generate uh, in a static world without thinking about hydroplaning gases and all that is going to be wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, can, we can work with that with this risk hazard platform. Fracking, I don't know if we even have enough. I would just, I only said that because you said put earthquakes on here, right? I, you know, for the food security though, the, the fact that you're in a conflict zone 
and you have a drought at the same time. That's huge. And that doesn't have anything to do with our science. That's where the NGOs, they, they have to think about how much protection do I need under those conditions. Can I, you know, if it's a conflict zone and it's a 10-year event, it may be far worse than a 50-year event in a country that's reasonably stable, right? So this thing is not without lots of risk and lots of thinking about how you downscale this with the right groups in, in these countries that are working and have more knowledge than we do. Remember, everything's about asymmetric information in my world. All right, well, it's time for pizza. Happy to talk to anybody who wants to come up and ask any other questions. Thanks.